says, yes, I did. And, and the judge says, do you know that by writing these things that you've broken a law? You've broken a British law. And you are, you know, you are guilty of sedition by writing these things about freedom in this magazine. And Gandhi said, yes, and, and, and by, according to your, your laws, then, therefore, uh, uh, kind of like, do with me what you will. He put his hands up like this, almost like, you know, I'm not changing my ideas. I wrote what I, about freedom, and if that seemed to break your law, then here I am. Uh, you know, go ahead, do what you want. And basically, what, what that was basically saying was, Gandhi was saying, I have a principle in my heart that I know to be true. And I'm going to stand by my principle, and you can do what you want. He was basically saying to the world, do whatever you want. I'm, stay, I'm sticking with my principle. He's saying the same thing. Yeah, same thing. Do what you want. I'm standing for love. I'm standing for peace and nonviolence. So, we're at the point now where it's like, you're starting to really start to see that, that it's not outside yourself that has to change. It's not something in the world that has to change. It's, it's a decision in mind. If I'm feeling upset, it's because I'm choosing to feel upset. Not because something in the world is making me upset. If I'm feeling, um, I'm feeling chaotic, it's because I'm choosing to feel chaotic. Not because the world is chaotic and the world is making me feel chaotic. Or it's like, you know, when you go to a movie, sometimes people say, did you like the movie? Was it a good movie or a bad movie? Well, there you go, right away. Uh, was it an action movie? Was it a mystery? Was it a, a comedy? Was it a romance? Did the movie make you laugh? Make you laugh? Did the movie make you cry? Make you cry? You hear the, the causation is, was it a sad movie that made you cry? It's all backwards. This whole mesmerism, which if you listen carefully to the con conversations of the world, everybody's either giving credit to things, or the movie made me laugh, or uh, my partner, my soulmate, puts me in ecstasy. Uh, <laughs> you know, no, I'm sorry, it's not the soulmate uh, that puts you in ecstasy. You choose to put yourself, to let your mind soar into ecstasy, but it's not going to be the partner, or going to be the, the circumstance. It's not your valentine that puts you in ecstasy, it's, it's your mind. So, so we're really having, this is really explaining a, a turnaround here. When I blame fear something in the world, it is to avoid seeing that the upset and resolution, as they really are, a decision in my mind, and to instead maintain an image of the self-concept. So every time you feel like the world is doing it to you, all it is is you're wishing to maintain the ego self-concept that God did not create. That's really what's going on. If you cut through all of the, the seeming complexities, if you make it real simple, that's what's going on. This mind trick seems to displace guilt and fear, but actually maintains feelings of upset. So, you know how the people say, get it off your chest, you'll feel better. So you get it off your chest and you yell at somebody, and do you feel better? No, you don't feel better when you yell at somebody. You feel guilty. No, you think you don't judge it. You say, <laughs> you say, why did I do that? You know, but but the whole idea of get it off your chest, if it gets into to blaming or yelling at somebody or whatever, I'll give them what for. I'll tell them, you know, to their face. You know, I'll show them. They're they're going to hear from me. You know, when you, you can hear those thoughts going on in your mind, they're going to hear from me. It's like pushing it out, pushing it out. And if you've actually got something where you're blaming yourself, the mind trick seems to maintain the guilt and the fear, yes. rather than displace it, doesn't it? It keeps it going. Yes. It so, for example, if yeah. you seem to project the guilt to your body, and the body seems to develop symptoms, that just keeps it going. 
that's not going to end the guilt. Then you feel bad, especially when you get into metaphysics, you think, oh, I'm doing this to myself. Now I've made myself sick. But that doesn't feel good. <laughs> you know, nobody likes to think. And, and it's almost like, it's like suicide. People don't like to talk about suicide. It's one of those things, the press, the media, nobody likes to talk about suicide. But you might say that, that every time you experience any kind of upset or doubt or discomfort or pain or, or suffering, it's just a version of suicide. It's a version of killing yourself, of like trying to murder your Christ self, your, your spiritual self, push that out of awareness and maintain that you're something small. You know, that you're an ego. So it's a form of suicide every time, you know, you you blame yourself or you take something personally or you you know, you take it. Whether it's this self or or other bodies. So but but what we're saying here is number seven is saying it's a decision that you're making in your mind and you must get back into your mind and choose again. It's not gonna help you to to project, and it's not going to help you to repre repress, you know, try to eat, smooth it over and just smile, even though you've got this emotion going on. So this is great. The, this mind trick seems to displace the guilt and fear, but it actually maintains the feelings of upset. To blame or fear an image of self other the world requires that I believe I am limited to a body and a world of bodies, and denies the spiritual abstract reality of my being. As a first step in letting go of all upset, I want to see in my mind what I thought was outside it. Being upset about A, so now you get to, to bring it back to your specific thing, being upset about A is only another attempt to make C the cause of my guilt and fear. It's a trick. The ego's like saying, yeah, you're upset, and you've got good reason. You know, give them what for. You tell them. Enough's enough. I'm drawing the line. I'm not going to take your stuff anymore. You know, you're the blame, and I'm putting a stop to it right here. But that, that, attaching that, A, to see is still only trying to justify that. Um, but I think, you know, that, that's the point. You know, when you sort of say you project it onto the body and you project it onto the body, you associate it to your own. That's kind of like a good point. You know how you both kind of use the body of David or the body of the person? Or the kind of removes it a little bit, doesn't it sort of separates yourself out from the body that you think? Yeah, you can talk about it. Like, it's like Krishnamurti, when he was talking, he wouldn't, he wouldn't even say, don't take what I say to be the truth. He would say, don't take what the speaker says to be the truth. He was so far back and so detached from Krishnamurti, that he wouldn't say, don't take what I say to be the truth, find out for yourself. He would say, don't take what the speaker says to be the truth, find out for yourself. So he was really pulling it back into the mind, and he was asking everybody else to do the same thing, you know, to find it within their mind. So it's pretty, it's pretty strong when you really look at that. Now, we're going to finally get another letter here. We've got A, B, C, and D. We're ready to bring in E. E for expectation. Now we're getting down to the release point. We're getting to the point where you can start to really release it from your mind. Number eight. Upset seems valuable and justifiable when A runs counter to what I wanted. So whatever that scenario, situation, event, or person was that you had listed in A, you could say that upset seems valuable and justifiable when A runs counter to what I wanted. It could be around the smallest thing. You go to a restaurant, let's say, and the reason you go to this restaurant is because they serve your favorite food. 
that's why you go to the restaurant, you know, or because they have fast service, or because they have inexpensive meals or something. But let's say it's your favorite food. So you go down to your restaurant, you're sitting there, well, you're almost salivating in anticipation of that plate coming, you know, with your favorite dish, and the waitress comes out and you order it, and then she goes, oh, I'm so sorry. We don't have it. But, but I come here for the very reason that you serve this food. It's my favorite food. You, know, you can see if there is an expectation that you would go to this restaurant and be served your favorite dish, and you get upset, it's because something in form has run contrary to what you wanted. They're not supposed to, the scenario, what? You're not supposed to come out and tell me no. You, I've come here a hundred times, and you've said yes, and now the hundred and first time, I said no. Oh, you feel your heart drop. You don't have it. You don't have it. So it could be something as simple as that, but this, that's why we call E for expectation. And E is something what I wanted or expected. That's what we're calling E, it's an expectation. Is an action, situation, event. It's something to be different in the script. If you really wanted to put, put words to E, I expected something would be different in this script. Whatever. Whatever seems to be occurring, you're just saying, I, I, I wish it was different. This is your ideal way to do it. Yes. Yes. You've got some ideal, and, it, and the script is not meeting that ideal. It happens like in relationships. You, Let's say you marry somebody and you think, wow, oh, they really look good. I like this image now that I'm associated with. I'm happy to call them partner. And then, let's say they put on 150 pounds, or they seem to develop uh, uh, Tourette syndrome, <laughs> and, they're, and they're just <laughs> they're swearing at you. <laughs> you're, just, you're, just, you're just thinking, what? I married a partner, and now they got Tourette. What did I say? What did I say? The death do we part? Oh my God! What am I gonna do? You know, it, 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 this typically happens in relationships, and it may happen like in like job scenarios. You take a job, and you. I mean, you read about the job, and it looks like it's a pretty good job, and then you get into the job, and maybe it's more boring, it's more mundane, or maybe there's co-workers that seem like they've been sent from the devil uh, to sink your boat, and you think, it looked like a pretty decent job, when I, I mean, that's why I interviewed for it, it looked like better pay, and there'd be all these fringe benefits, and I really thought it would be a good job, and now it's not meeting up to my ideal, it's turning into a nightmare. It's because your expectations for that job are not being met. So you can see that E is very important on this worksheet, because what's what we've done, all this work here on page one, and now we're into page two, was just to start to get in touch with E. What is the expectation I had down there that is not being fulfilled? And E is whatever it is, action, situation, event, person. I still believe in some form of lack, which is D. So I think I need E to be happy, complete, and at peace. Now we're getting down to the real nitty gritty. I'm, I still have a self-concept, an identity image, that I believe is lacking, and I think I need E to be happy. I think I need an outcome. I think I need the world to turn out in a particular way, or the script to go a certain way for me to be happy. Is this belief in lack, and the resulting expectations more important to me than peace of mind? Mm, that's a real interesting question. That's when you really get down to the rubber meets the road. <laughs> Is this belief in lack and the resulting expectation more important to me than peace of mind? Ah, so, if the, the future is only based on past, and you let that go just as much as you let the past go. Yes. Yeah? Yeah, that's it. That's where you come to atonement. 
Because in the Course in Miracles, Jesus actually says, atonement.